This is episode number 46 with Meha Agrawal, founder and CEO of Silk and Sonder. Welcome to the Good Life Coach Podcast. I am your host, Michelle Lamoureux. The intention of this show is to awaken you to your fullest potential. Join me each week for inspiring interviews to elevate an area of your life, as well as interviews with women entrepreneurs who are creating success on their own terms. Each episode provides actionable tips to guide you to design a life you love. Hey there, it's Michelle and welcome back. Today on the show, I have on Meha Agrawal, who is the founder and CEO of a company called Silk and Sonder. Her company is a self-care and mental wellness startup based out of San Francisco. And so she launched her signature product, which is a guided monthly planner and journal subscription service, which is inspired by positive psychology and bullet journaling techniques so that you can make your self-care more personalized, accessible, and actionable from the comfort of your home. And I wanted to talk to Meha for two reasons. One is because she has an interesting entrepreneurial journey. She worked prior to launching her company at Stitch Fix, The Muse, and Goldman Sachs. So she had a pretty great career starting right out of college. And it's always interesting to hear why someone wants to launch and do something so innovative. But the other reason is because, as you know, we talk a lot about self-care. I ask the entrepreneurs that come on every episode to talk to us about their habits that make them successful, whether that's a morning or evening routine. But even more foundational than that, what I'm seeing is that women are really burnt out and overworked and overwhelmed and sliding from one day into the next. And I believe that self-care is really an act of self-love and that when we take the time to prioritize what we really need, that our life comes back into balance in a good way. It doesn't mean that you're not as busy. It just means that when those hurdles come your way, you can manage them with more grace and ease. And you have the satisfaction of knowing that you're taking care of you. I do want to introduce you to Meha, and I know you'll enjoy hearing about her entrepreneurial journey and the intention behind starting Silk and Sonder. So here we go. Meha, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I'm excited to learn more about you and the work that you're doing. I think everyone needs self-help, so I'm very curious how you came to start Silk and Sonder and want to bring this to people in a different way than it's out there. But I usually ask that people just start by introducing themselves a bit so my audience can get to know you a little bit and more about your backstory. I know that you were a software engineer and also a product manager for Goldman, Stitch Fix, through IPO, The Muse, like you've had an interesting background. So take us into your story. Sure. So I I guess my story starts um, where I grew up. So I was born and raised in Santa Barbara, California. Mm. Uh, Both my parents are of South Asian descent. So my father was a professor of computer science and my mother worked on the business administration side of things uh, for the religious studies department at UC Santa Barbara. And so, you know, my story really begins there because uh, just being a, a good Indian daughter, I ended up going to USC to study both computer science and Mm. business administration. And that's what really led me to begin my career as a software engineer. So like you mentioned, I moved out to New York. I worked for Goldman Sachs for a bit. I realized that financial services was not my calling. And Mm. so I ended up jumping ship and joining the Muse as their third engineer and eighth employee. Wow. Um, Yeah. So that's really when I, when I really experienced what it was like to build a startup from the ground up Mm. and working alongside the founders there, I realized that I also had the crazies and made up to pursue an idea of my own one day. Mm. So, you know, I dabbled in a couple uh, side projects here and there, and then somehow found myself in San Francisco working for Stitch Fix, which was a quiet unicorn at the time. (laughs) Yeah. Through through IPO. Um, And then, you know, my last kind of full-time gig was at a company called 
Fueled, where I helped early stage founders conceptualize and launch the minimum viable product versions of their mobile apps across a variety of industries. So a lot of amazing tech experience, and and that's probably what what led me to really discovering uh, self help and self improvement because every couple of years I would I would deal with my ruts. So um, awesome experience, but definitely digitally exhausting mm. uh, to be in that environment. So when did you actually launch your company then? Yeah. So I actually launched my company while I was at Stitch Fix. Um, I was working on a different idea at the time, actually in the South Asian luxury wedding planning, you know, uh, industry. And I, uh, decided that I wanted to work on something that was a little bit more tangible and a buddy and, and, and I were out to dinner and we were talking about all these books that we were reading around self-help and mindfulness. And, you know, this concept of bullet journaling was taking off mm. with, uh, mood tracking and habit tracking. And if you scroll through Instagram or look online, there were these beautiful layouts um, to inspire you to really, mm. you know, take stock of, of what motivates you and, and how to track things every day. And I tried to reproduce that and that really didn't work. Uh, it ended up looking like a laundry list of to-dos. And mm. so um, that's when I decided to kind of create a, a beautifully designed monthly planner meets a journal. Um, I had discovered journaling by this point, and I just wanted to see if anyone would actually purchase it, and they did. And so, as a nights and weekends project, we grew that, um, you know, to several monthly active subscribers. And ultimately, I decided to quit my job after I had already decided to work for Fueled and things like that. Wow. Okay. So you always knew you wanted to be an entrepreneur. You were in these entrepreneurial environments and you felt that that part of you go, hey, this is exciting. I can do this. Now you had one concept which you were thinking about doing, but was was the idea to create a product and launch an entrepreneurial business or was it fueled out of this passion to create something more specific. So I've had, you know, a lot of the women that come on have this sort of whisper, like it's so unique what they want to do and they Mm -hmm. have to follow it. And then I had a guest recently and I thought it was interesting. She wanted to create a lifestyle. And so she created a product around the life she wanted to live. So I'm curious where you fit within that. Yeah, I think truthfully, it's probably a blend. I think I, I didn't realize it in college, but you know, when I when I look back at my life, I've started multiple organizations. I think I think there's there's always been this entrepreneurial bug, but mm. um, coming from an academic household where our career paths were, you know, either to be a doctor or a lawyer or a PhD academic um, or or you know an engineer, I think being an entrepreneur was not really an option. Mm. Um, but when I when I experienced that or when I kind of immersed myself in that atmosphere, I started to realize that one of my natural skills or muscles is, is thinking outside the box and, mm. and kind of coming up with ideas. Um, but execution is, is critical, right? And so I think to answer your question, I think it's a blend. I think I know the type of lifestyle that I want to live. And mm. I also know what motivates me. And I think Silk and Sonder is a natural fit. And, and I think it's because I'm working on problems that I can relate to for an audience that I can relate to. And, you know, prior to that, when I was working on my other idea, it was, it was going after just wanting to be an entrepreneur and and kind Mm. of seeing a problem that was interesting and, um, you know, and, and important in the wedding planning space, but then later realizing that I actually hate logistics. I hate planning. I hate a lot of the elements that would have been critical to succeed as an entrepreneur in that space, whereas Silk and Sonder feels so natural. You know, the problem's that people talk about, the community that we're building. Um, I just get lost in it. It doesn't even feel like work. Mm, that's beautiful. I love hearing that. That's so cool. <laughs> um, so you, men- you mentioned a partner. So who are, do you have a co-founder? Yeah, actually, no, I don't have a co-founder, but a buddy of mine actually helped me start the business. Okay. Um, and so he and I worked on it, but ultimately he had to um, tend to his family business needs. And yeah. so we had a very great breakup. I mean, he was just so self-aware and and he's still a dear friend. And so we joke about it over dinner, but, um, thankfully I didn't have, you know, anything dramatic like some other people have had in the past. Yeah. So you conceived the idea with him though. It sounds like, is that right? I just want to, I like getting into the sort of how things start. Yeah. So I would say that the, that our actual MVP, so our, our 
product today, the the design and things like that was influenced by him. But mm-hmm. um, the vision of really becoming this Peloton meets Weight Watchers for mental wellness um, that came afterwards. So so I think the evolution has been predominantly me, but the initial MVP and concept was definitely um, you know shared shared discussion. Okay. So this is cool. So I, I like the, uh, what did you just say? Weight Watchers meets Peloton. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we'll take this into, so, um, what is Silken Sonder? What is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. So Silken Sonder is a self-care and mental wellness experience for modern women. Um, our vision, like I mentioned, is to really, uh, build on the pillars of community and data to offer personalized solutions for daily self-help and self-care routines. Mm. Um, you know, traditionally when you think about how self-care has manifested itself, it's been in the forms of indulgence. So many petties mm. and massages and, um, expensive skincare routines. And while all of that is necessary, it's just not practical to do that every single day at every single moment. And so Silk and Saunders is taking a stance that true self-care is about mental clarity and human connection. Mm-hmm. Um, and we believe that in our digitally exhausted world, uh, where we're overstimulated by our gadgets, uh, that self-care requires a bit of unplugging. And so we decided to launch with uh, the first ever self-care monthly planner and journal subscription service. So mm-hmm. you get a physical product, which is a blend of reflection, intention, and action uh, straight to your doorstep every month. It's a little bit of familiarity, but a, a lot of um, elements of surprise bundled in one. And you know, with that, as well as access to our exclusive community online, you are able to to discover yourself and reflect and have a guided experience to what we consider true self-care, which begins with your mind. Okay. So you get a physical journal every month, like the beginning or just before the beginning of the month starts. And what kinds of things does it include? Like what exercises does it take you through to create that, uh, to focus on your mental care and human connection, which I love that that's the focus, by the way. We talk a lot about self-care on the show. It's the handout I give is 52 (laughs) self-care tips. I think it's so essential. And even just creating more awareness of whether you're making time for it. And to me, I think like even just making time, like you said, human connection, making time to be with a friend and having a cup of tea, that's self-care. It's, yeah, it's exactly. not about all these scheduled, you know, over, you know, that costs money. It's a lot of it is just connecting. So take us into the journal a little bit more then. So what would I get? It, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, we center each journal slash planner on a different theme every month. So mm-hmm. in the past we've had, uh, adoration, uh, momentum, nostalgia, mm-hmm. just different themes to center our prompts around. And so inside you'll find guided journaling prompts. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for example, if we're talking about nostalgia, we ask you to reflect back into your childhood and how some of those decisions have formed, um, how you, how you make decisions today. Um, and then similarly, we have, uh, different exercises around mood tracking, habit tracking, monthly intentions, weekly intentions, mm. meal planning. Uh, we also have fun little exercises that we swap out every month. So last month we had a self-care bingo challenge. This month we have a adoration jar where customers actually, uh, not only write what they adore about themselves, but they also ask their friends and family, to give them, you know, ideas on, on what they actually adore about them. And so it's a really fun Mm. way to go outside your comfort zone and kind of do things that, uh, you wouldn't typically do or seek out yourself in your regular day-to-day journaling routine. So cool. And so what's the online component then? Yeah. So, um, eventually we're going to have, uh, a, a, a digital companion to our currently offline experience. But right now you join our Facebook group slash community where you apply to join. And then every week we allow, you know, a cohort in and there it's not just about exchanging ideas and tips on how to get the most out of your Silk and Sonder planners and journals, but it's also about, um, you know, meeting up in real life, talking about, uh, new ideas on how to improve the product. Mm. There are lots of discussions happening about general broader themes around self-care and mental wellness. People are very transparent about their emotional health concerns. Mm. And what I find most humbling about all of this is that, you know, we didn't really know that there would be a direct correlation between bringing pen to paper and, and reaping these benefits Mm. of, um, 
you know, emotional health. But what we're finding is that there are a number of customers who share similar emotional health issues and concerns, and they are willing to help each other through those journeys. And so that sense of accountability is organically emerging from our online component, which right now is a community. Um, and we also host a couple of Sondra circles every month where people mm. can gather in life and um, lead them through a guided journaling experience. And where are those? Are they different regions <laughs> or one location? Right Currently, now. it's just in San Francisco because I am facilitating that right now. Yeah, but cool. Oh, that's is cool. To, to expand. Yeah. So you have a broader vision, which we'll get into in a minute. So as you're talking, I'm just wondering then, so who is your target market? Like, who's your demographic? Yeah, so it's definitely predominantly women, although yeah. we do have some men that, that use our product. Yeah. Um, a lot of our customers actually joke that their husbands and boyfriends are stealing their Silken Saunders. So <laughs> uh, <laughs> we will, we will serve them soon. Um, but yeah, it's, it's predominantly women, uh, typically in their late twenties, thirties, forties, fifties, and even sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it kind of makes sense, right? Our demographic skews, uh, a little bit older because women tend to have gone through life and hell and back, mm-hmm. right? And so what we're finding is that a lot of our customers are mothers. Uh, you know, some of them are on the coastal regions, but a lot of them are in the Midwest and the South. We really are serving the needs of women in all 50 states right now. Mm. Um, and and we're excited to be that reminder for self-care for women who tend to prioritize others' needs over their own. 100%. That's that's the issue. <laughs> that's yeah, exactly that's what right. happens. <laughs> well, so how much of your tech background then impacts what you do and create? Because, like, you know, even when you talk about the monthly themes, you know, how are you originating these ideas and deciding what goes in and when, you know? Yeah, definitely. So we are, we, we have a scientific board of advisors that we continue to build, um, with psychologists and coaches, but, um, you know, as an MVP, it was predominantly me and my own research, um, and my just, you know, conversations with, with various coaches and and psychologists. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say that, you know, to answer your question around how much of my tech experience goes in, I think the tech experience really is all about problem solving Mm -hmm. and thinking about how do you take a very complex, uh, experience like emotional health and, and, um, you know, enabling that sense of clarity for people who don't belong in boxes and are quite unique from one another Mm -hmm. and how do you create a minimum viable product. And I think that's where my tech experience really comes into play because so much of being a product manager is identifying what are the must haves versus need, you know, versus nice to haves and creating a product around that. And then the software engineer in me is thinking about how can we, um, you know, identify opportunities to personalize this and collect the, the right data points in an ethical way so that we can better serve the needs of our customers. And so, I would say, you know, on the surface, it might seem like very little engineering skill set has gone in. But when you think about how we've decided to execute and and why we've decided to stick to one product, one SKU every month, Mm. rather than launch many products at once, it's really intentional. Um, And what we're finding is that customers use Silk and Sonder in in different ways. So we don't want to uh, over-personalize either. Um, and we're really becoming strategic about what the, those next products might look like and, and how we might add that layer of personalization um, and deliver on that promise in the future. Yeah, and that makes so much sense. And I just want you to, can you just define MVP for people who might not be sure. familiar? Yeah. Yeah. So an MVP is, uh, it stands for minimum viable product. It's a term that we use, I think both in business and technology Mm -hmm. quite often. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, as a founder, especially when you have a lot of ideas, it's easy to build beyond the MVP and add a ton of bells and whistles. But what an MVP really is, is, is creating a product with the minimum set of features so that, uh, you know, your users will actually find that product functional and useful. Uh, and kind of leaving the nice to haves for later. Yeah. And how much did your personal experiences impact what you do focus on with the journal and what you've included? So you had shared with me prior to the show that you had battled anxiety, stress, burnout, and self-doubt. And so I'm curious, like, you know, how did that show up in your life and how did you use this journal as a way to maybe help yourself yeah. and others solve for that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So actually, um, like I mentioned, I, I periodically would hit these ruts, right? And I think it was because deep down, I've always um, known that I wanted to do something bigger than just being a software engineer. Mm-hmm. And I would instead put a Band-Aid on that and find a new new job at a, at a company that you know, excited me and I kept doing the same thing over and over. And so every two years I would, I would hit this rut where I felt underfulfilled. I'd wake up anxious every morning. I would be ungrateful. I would Mm. complain. I was caught in negativity. And then, you know, as life happens, I went through breakups. I went through, um, you know, multiple moves. There were mice in my apartment. So externally Mm. there were all these things to blame. And, um, perhaps the most pivotal point was when I decided to move back from New York to Santa Barbara. My parents were downsizing at the time, and there was just a lot of things happening externally that I was blaming and then mm. self victimizing, and I was caught in the spiral. And eventually, what happened was you know, I come from a South Asian background, so coaching and therapy isn't something that we talk about in the house. Mm. Uh, we don't really talk about mental and emotional health. And inside, I could feel myself being a monster, someone that I I didn't want to be, but I also couldn't blame others because Mm -hmm. I had inflicted these decisions on myself. Um, So I tried a number of things, right? I first obviously called my friends and bothered them a lot. They stopped picking up my my phone. (laughs) phone Um, I tried to meditate. Meditation is a great practice for those that it works for, but it's not always the most effective for someone um, like me. And mm-hmm. so that didn't really work out. And then people kept telling me to journal and I was very reluctant. Perhaps it's me having been an engineer or just never succeeding in the Dear Diary mm-hmm. uh, experience growing up. And I really found that process to be intimidating and unuseful. I didn't know what to write about. Um, and eventually when I kind of exhausted all options, I, I started to read all these books on self-help and mindfulness. And while I found a lot of the content to be inspirational, I realized that once the book was over, I didn't really know how to integrate Mm -hmm. it into my life. And so I started to create this guide for myself through the magic of bringing pen to paper and immediately noticed this magical shift to my emotional health. And I think that is what led me from a personal standpoint to create, you know, Silk and Sonder in its current form, which is that guided journal. Yeah. Pen to paper is so powerful. I mean, there's so much yeah. research on that. Um, what does Silk and Sonder stand for? I'm always curious how somebody conceived a name. Yeah. So um, Sonder, don't feel bad if you don't know what the word means, because it is actually a made up word that only exists in the dictionary of obscure sorrows. Um, (laughs) but it does have a profound meaning. It basically means that every passerby is living this life populated by their own ambitions, their own worries, their own struggles, their own dreams. And you think that you're living this life alone and in isolation, but in reality, we feel that weight of life, uh, in lanes agnostic to each other. Mm. And so silk is our attempt to add smoothness to that, uh, complexity of, of, um, you know, feeling isolated in, in your own world, but really experiencing the same thing that the person next to you is experiencing. It's a, it's a beautiful name. And did you come up with it or was it like a brainstorm or is it something that just came to you? It it was a little bit of research and, um, you know, kind of thinking about the brand that we wanted to build. It was, it was very intentional that I didn't choose something that had planner or journal because mm. our vision has been to be something bigger than that. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, it was a little bit of brainstorming, a little bit of researching, a little bit of, um, you know, searching for powerful, profound words rather than generic ones. Yeah, that's so key. And it's actually interesting because I was going to ask you with all the planners out there, right? There's so many journals and ways to, you know, people are trying to say, you you know, let's help you with this kind of stuff, whether it's goal goal setting or self-care. How did you know how to differentiate yourself? You know, did did you at any point think, gosh, the market's so saturated, or I'm going to just, as a problem solver, I'm just going to redo this. I'm going to do it a different way. Like, take us into your thinking. Yeah. So I think um, the best decision that I ever made with Silk and Sonder was to not overthink things, Mm. um, because I had learned my lessons from uh, my previous 
startup side hustle type thing. Um, and what I realized was that nothing was working for me, right? I would buy these agendas in, in January. I wouldn't use them. Then I think to get, you know, more productive halfway through the year, but I didn't want to pay for an annual agenda mm-hmm. because half of the year is gone. Um, and then I tried to use a beautiful soft cover moleskin to mm-hmm. create my own version of a journal. And that too was a fail because it didn't look like what I was seeing online. And so, um, lucky for us, no one was doing a monthly cadence mm. of direct to consumer for a planner. Um, and no one was doing this really thoughtful and authentic, um, combination of po- positive psychology inspired, uh, along with bullet journaling, um, in, in a, in a monthly cadence. And, I had learned from my days in Stitch Fix that if you establish a relationship with your customers, Mm -hmm. you can start to collect really interesting data points on who they are and how they evolve so you can better serve them and personalize. And so our vision has always been that, you know, we want to personalize self-help and make it more accessible and actionable for all because currently self-help is incredibly superficial and we Mm -hmm. place people into boxes Mm -hmm. and that's not how people feel better. And so yeah, I think in, in in order to differentiate, it was really just coming up with a subscription version uh, that was a bit of a surprise so that competitors don't even know what to include in their products to compete with us. <laughs> That's great. I love this. Okay. The problem solver is solving problems. You're not, and you had, I was curious what you might have learned at Stitch Fix or one of the other companies that impacted. And so that's interesting because that is a subscription model. I've not used them, but I know a lot of people who do and love that kind of idea where it just comes, it makes it easy for you. But the difference with a journal is that the person, unlike a piece of clothing that either fits or doesn't fit, looks good, doesn't, you know, you like it, you don't, you ship it back. With a planner now, you still have to take that pen and put it to paper. So how yep. does the monthly system or how does this help somebody create those habits that they want to create? Because I've done that too. I've bought, I won't name the journal, but I've bought one of yeah. these <laughs> very popular ones that everyone swears by. And, you know, I'll do it for two weeks and then I don't. I do it, my, I, I'll just grab a regular notebook and write gratitudes in there. I sort of like to do it. I customize it for myself. So, right. so how do you create those habits with people? Yeah, I think it's um it is a very challenging problem, but I think what we're doing is we're making that path to self-improvement a bit easier. So, mm. you know, we're not super repetitive like some of our competitors and yes. we're not you're super... not looking at that same page every day. Exactly. <laughs> where you're exactly. like I'm kind of bored of these. <laughs> I, yeah, yeah. Exactly. It's kind of like an adult activity book and some of those activities are not going to resonate for you, but the trust that we have with our customers is mm. that we have a feedback loop and you tell us which um, pages you liked and which ones you did not And, you know, right now we're aggregating that feedback as a whole. And so, mm. you know, there've been months where we take out a certain page or a layout and then customers are very angry. An example is the coloring page that we ah. include. And, you know, I personally don't use it. Um, people but, loved um, it. Yeah. Those are popular. Yeah, exactly. And mm. the feedback that we received is, you know, when they would go out and buy an adult coloring book, it was so repetitive and intimidating and overwhelming because yeah. there's so many pages to color, whereas Silk and Sonder only has one a month. And that therapeutic, you know, power of using colored pencils and, and having that stress relief mm. is enough for the whole month. Um, and so when we took that page out, there was definitely a reaction, but there was also this trust that, Hey, we know you took it out this month, but can you please bring it back in next month? And, um, it's actually a funny story. One of our own customers is now an illustrator for all the coloring oh, pages. Wow. That we- yeah. That's cool. That's actually a great story. Um, so can people subscribe? Do they have to commit for a year? How does the actual subscription work? Yeah. So they don't have to commit for a year. You can commit on a monthly cadence. Um, you obviously get a pr- pretty hefty discount if you do commit for the year, but um, you can subscribe monthly or annual. We have a number of customers who actually gift themselves the three month, six month or 12 month package. Um, and what we do tell customers is that Silk and Sonder, unfortunately or fortunately, is a habit in itself, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a commitment to yourself and it's a commitment to yourself with others. And I think that is 
how we really want to differentiate from any of our competitors is really making accountability uh, part of the equation and making sure that you feel like you can, uh, you know, leave your booklet incomplete and still feel that you uh, improve your journey and self-discovery and self-reflection for the month. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't, you can start afresh the next month and no one's going to judge you. Do some people want to just finish though? You know, those people who just really need to finish something. So even if they didn't finish it in time, like, do you get feedback around that? We actually do have some customers who are craving more introspective prompts because they'll finish all their journaling activities in the beginning of the month. Interesting. They actually get through it too fast. It's the other issue. Yeah. Yeah. But we do have customers who, you know, the thing is, is that we're also a planner, right? So there's no way you can finish the entire booklet because part of it is planning for the week. Um, And so you have that fresh start every Sunday to plan for your entire week. Mm. That's so nice. And your and your tasks. Yeah. So it's all encompassing. So you really can just like you mentioned, even health and goal setting, everything's in there all. And that was obviously by design. Yes. Yeah, that's great. Now, people are going to listen and think, gosh, you know, I've got an idea. I've got a concept. How did she go from concept to launch? I love asking my guests this because those very first steps, like, how did you know how to produce a journal? How did you know where to go to get one made? Like, how did you get, you know, figure that stuff out? Yeah. So I think the promise I made to myself with Silk and Sonder was, I would not hash out a business plan. I wouldn't do a pitch deck. I would do none of that until I got one sale. And so what what we did was I thought about, okay, what are the things that I would want in my, you know, personalized planner slash journal? There were some books that I love, like The One Thing, uh, Four Hour Work Week, things like that. And so I started to borrow elements from the books that I was reading, as well as the layouts that I was hoping to recreate, but miserably failing. And, you know, with the help of my friend, we kind of designed that online on Mm. InDesign. Mm. And um, then even before we figured out the paper quality and things like that, we literally printed it on the printer Mm. and we took it to some friends, some friends of friends. We got some feedback. We iterated we decided we wanted to create this hybrid of a planner journal and a magazine. So we had some content in there and then coded up a website. So this is a funny story, but my advice is to just get started because um, if you overthink, you're just going to be coming up with a million reasons on why it's not going to work. And I was intimidated by Shopify. I didn't know how it worked. I was confused. So I decided to code it myself. And <laughs> I love that that was strength. simpler yeah. for you. Yeah. I'm just going to code it. Forget Shopify. Exactly. You know, I can't control what it looks like with these templates, you know, they're so restricting. And mm. so, you know, you just got to lean on whatever you do know, and yeah. then assume that you can figure the rest out. And so once we did that, we also found a printing press. I had no idea what a printing press was, but I knew that at the very least we could go to Kinko's and print something. So Mm -hmm. um, I think it's really just trusting that the answers are there. And, um, you know, from concept, we didn't really do much besides collect some feedback and then launch a website and then see if we could, we could get an order from, you know, at least a friend of a friend. And we did that on the first day. And then before you know it, we had to migrate to Shopify eventually because Mm -hmm. fulfillment was a disaster. But I think what I've learned is that you're constantly taking many concepts to launch throughout the trajectory of of starting and scaling a business. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be so many moments where you have no idea what you're doing or how you're going to do it, but you have to just you just have to start and you have to get re- really, really resourceful of, of where the answers are. And I think the beauty of this day and age is that they're usually all on the internet. Every single answer you're looking for is either a phone call away or a Google search away. And, um, you know, don't be shy in asking a friend or an acquaintance for a little bit of advice because um, that advice really serves you and you can get almost anything done. Yeah, that's, I love that advice. And are you self-funded or are you looking for financing? What was the plan on that? Because you worked with startups that were obviously funded, right? Yes, startups that were very well funded. Mm -hmm. Um, I initially, this was all bootstrapped as a side project. Mm -hmm. And when I decided to quit and work on this full time, the good news is that if we just wanted to be a journal business, we could totally continue to self-fund because the margins pan out. But 
you know, our vision is so much more involved than that. We want to be this go-to iconic mental wellness brand that brings Mm. play back for adults. And so in order to execute on that vision and deliver on our promise of personalizing and community building, there's a little bit of capital that's required. So I'm actively fundraising right now, um, a small pre-seed slash angel round so that we can fuel that and really build out the other touch points for our customers. Yeah, I'm curious, how is it as a woman going into these environments? Because I've just heard different things about, you know, I, I saw a stat recently, I think Ariana Huffington or maybe Sarah Blake, somebody, somebody posted it with the small percentage of women funded companies yeah. and how that needs to change. So I'm just curious what your experience has been. Yeah, you know, um, I have a lot of thoughts. In fact, I'll probably write an article on this. Um, I, I, I hit a lot of checkboxes, right? I'm a solo technical female founder of color. And mm-hmm. so I think for every positive, there is what there's a negative, right? Mm-hmm. Um, being a solo founder is, is not the easiest to fundraise with. Um, but I think there's a couple of things. One is my experience is that, uh, and, and, and just thinking about, um, all my female founder friends as well, I think rejection is really, really hard. And mm-hmm. when I look back at my career, I, I actively sought out opportunities where I could increase my conversion rate. So I only interviewed for companies that I actually wanted and thought I had a chance at and somehow got lucky or, or prepared better. Same thing with dating. I never thought of it as a numbers game. I really focus on the type of guy that I wanted to be with and, and go after that. And I, I think that. I think what's really hard is when you enter the fundraising ecosystem and everybody is telling you that it's a numbers game mm-hmm. and that you have to build this FOMO. And, and it's really hard, not just as a woman, but I think if you're an authentic person Mm -hmm. and, and want to do things in a way that's meaningful, you suddenly are up against a system that isn't working in your favor. And so my, my gut is that, and I've, I've experienced this, you know, just trying to fundraise myself, um, for women, especially we are conditioned by society to be perfectionists and seek out validation. And Mm -hmm. I think that is really, really hard to undo. And, and what I'm finding as exhausting, and in, in fundraising is even when you're getting polite maybes, right? You're not even getting no's. As women, we take that as being imperfect, right? Mm. And so, and then and then we're defining our own, you know, success metric based on peer validation, which is fundamentally flawed, right? They don't know what we're doing day to day or the vision that we want to build oftentimes. And so I think we lose faith in that process. And then we start to question, well, do we want to be a venture backable business or should we just self fund or I want to do it my way? You know, so I think there's a lot of, um, test points that, that we experience and, and we have to really decide, you know, is venture the right solution for us Mm -hmm. or is it better to be self-funded? And a lot of my female founder friends love being self-funded, but Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that comes from, you know, the lack of excitement that fundraising, has or doesn't have. And I, and I think it's, it's sad. Um, I, I really yeah. do think that the types of me being a woman, I can, I can definitely attest to the fact that, um, when I went into fundraising, given that we had customers, we were post revenue, actually post profitability, um, and some traction, I was told by my male counterparts that funding was going to be easy peasy for me. Mm. And what I'm finding is that, I have to provide a lot more data points than some of my male counterparts. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know if that's a gender thing or a consumer products thing that is to be decided, but mm-hmm. um, I think it fundamentally comes down to how, how women deal with rejection versus being brave and and going after, you know, what we deserve. I think it's just a flaw in our society that we have to correct earlier in our childhood. Yeah. And I um, I guess it's through networking and stuff too, maybe, you can find the people who are going to be more receptive or open to your concept, you know, just through your network. I think, you know, keeping that positive attitude too. And, and the way, like you said, you approach dating, you thought about what you wanted versus what the system is. You didn't put, you know, don't have those limiting beliefs going in. If that's the experience and it, it's true, it shows, you know, it proves it to be true that there's all this, you know, discrimination against the women looking to get funding, then, okay, fine. Check that box, move on. You're done. We're done. 
I'm going to find, I'm just going to keep going. Um, yeah. So let's talk about that. Cause this is about a mindset issue. So what drives you, what keeps you going every day? Like how do you move past those rejections and just the daily challenges of being a startup? Cause there it's a up and down sometimes just it's within 24 roller, hours. <laughs> exactly. It's a total roller coaster. Yes. I mean, it's, um, it's insane. So my, I actually wrote an article about how to stay sane during the fundraising process mm. because, um, I was experiencing, uh, imposter syndrome and self doubt. And I think as a company that's trying to solve for that, it's even more frustrating. Right. Mm. Um, but the, but what really works for me is a couple of things. Number one is, talking to my customers. That is where I get my sense of validation. And when I see the testimonials, when I see the types of conversations that are taking place, that helps me reconnect to my why. And it doesn't matter what our product is today or how it might evolve tomorrow. It's the fact that we are going after a very complex but necessary problem Mm -hmm. that we want to solve. And our customers are loving our you know current solution to that. Mm-hmm. So that helps me reconnect. So if you have customers, I highly recommend um, talking to your super customers, right? Don't talk to the ones that don't like you. Talk to the ones that do like you or read their testimonials and that helps you. Mm-hmm. Um, the second piece is, I think... And this is like, this is because I've, I've uh, you know, read a lot and gone through life coaching myself. I think knowing what your personal core values are and spending, you know... 10, 15 minutes every week thinking about how you plan to honor those personal core values, especially as a founder who's fundraising, it is so important to stick to that. And Mm. an example of this is, you know, I have 10 personal core values, but um, adventure, family, you know, thinking outside the box, those are some of the, some of my personal core values. And so I attach an activity for the week. So adventure for me is going, um, you know, to a new restaurant or, you know, something like that with, with friends or my significant other. And so thinking about how you can put in different activities throughout your week that go beyond your business, I think is very, very important because as founders, we sometimes feel like hamsters on the wheels. Mm -hmm. And so I would say, you know, reconnecting to your truth and and to your why, as well as honoring your personal core values is how you keep that mindset in place. Um, And also having your kind of personal board of advisors, and that can consist of other founders or, or, you know, maybe your first investors or advisors, um, just people who are there as your cheerleader squad and, and talking to them in moments of disbelief or doubt is super important. Mm. So what is the vision of the of Silk and Sonder then? Where do you see it going in the next five years? Yeah, so I think it really is um, being the ultimate destination for daily and proactive self-care, whether mm. it's from the comfort of your home or through other spaces, um, and really being the trusted platform to personalize self-help for communities globally. Oh, globally. Okay. So you've got a big vision. I love this. And so are you planning to be in stores at some point or do you want to own that relationship in the way like Stitch Fix did it? Yeah, I think um, for now we're really focused on maintaining a, you know, relationship with all of our customers. It allows us to iterate more quickly um, and, and kind of deliver on that promise for personalization. Um, I do, however, see an opportunity to have some variation of our product Mm. in in stores. Um, so whether it's a generic one or a preview or something like that, uh, I can see that being a really exciting avenue for us. But for now, we're really focused on direct to consumer. That's great. And how did you um, figure out, you know, cost for product versus, you know, just the logistics of how many customers to be profitable and to make it viable enough that you can leave your job? How did you do all yeah. of that? Because that's big. And I think that's where a lot of women, you know, struggle is like, how do you do those projections? Yeah. I think, um, the funny news is that we're we're constantly doing it, right? There's Mm. obviously always a printing partner that, um, can, can give you a better price point. And so I look at a couple of things or I looked at a couple of things. We actually, you know, we broke even at a certain point and then, you know, the margins are, only going to get better and better as you scale. And Mm -hmm. then you can put that money back into the business. I think if I had waited for my ideal, um, you know, number of customers to be able to pay myself and things like that, I, I don't think I would have been able to quit for quite a while. I think 
the way that I, I looked at it was, okay, maybe I don't have enough you know, money in the bank for an entire year, but I have some for the next three, four months. If I need to pick up a side job here and there to pay myself for rent or whatever it might be, I can do that. I also had some um, stocks that I, I was able to liquidate from Stitch Fix's mm. IPO. Um, and so I think, I think everybody has a different um, kind of pressure point in which they feel comfortable. And I, I do think that it's different for every single person. I'm not one to enjoy, you know, ramen in a hoodie. Like that's just never been my lifestyle. And I'm right. the first one to admit it. But I think there are other ways that you can save money, right? And so thinking about, you know, financially, what are you not going to, you know, budge on? And what are you able to save? And, um, and then projecting that out. And I think I have the confidence in knowing that, you know, fundraising or not, Silk and Sandra can be a very healthy, profitable business. And so who gets to benefit? I do. So I think trusting yourself and, and almost using that as a way to get to that point mm-hmm. is is important versus planning for it. Because if you if you think you can reach it just as a side hustle, it's it's gonna take you longer. And so it depends yeah. on how how aggressively you want to push for that. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um so I'm curious, how do you define self-care? What does it mean to you? Yeah, so I I define self care as um, as as having mental clarity, and true self care requires work um, in understanding what your what your core values are and what motivates you, and and knowing what routines grant you that kind of energy. But um, to me, self care is all in the mind and having a sense of clarity for what what makes you, you know, the best version of you. That's beautiful. Um, so I'm just curious though, using that framework, what does your self-care routine look like? Every yeah. Day? Yeah. Um, so my morning self-care routine, it consists of reading, uh, my kind of horoscope on CoStar. I'm not a huge astrology person, but it gives me some guidance into what my day might look like or what I can attach to my day. Then I spend somewhere between, 15 to 30 minutes, uh, free write journaling. Um, so typically that consists of a visualization exercise, gratitude, affirmations, things of that sort. Wait though, is that in your journal? So are you picking up, I would imagine this is from one of your journals. It's actually, so this is a free write that I do in a blank journal. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. But the third piece is planning my day with Silk and Sonder. So those are the three, three pieces to my, my morning routine. Um, and then, in the evening, I typically do two things. One is I spend about 20 to 30 minutes away from my phone and my computer, usually reading um, or, or something of that nature. And then other nights, I I watch TV. Yeah. <laughs> and that TV channel, it's funny because it's either super active or super you know dormant. So if I'm watching reality TV, it's not exercising my brain at all. Otherwise, it's the opposite, which is true crime and investigation. <laughs> so it's just funny. I think it's like it's, it's my it's my only way to fully unwind. Yeah. Um, and it's either totally engaged or totally not engaged. Yeah, that's your decompression strategy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so how do you define success? I think... Firstly, success is a journey, not a destination. And really success is measured by how frequently you're living in alignment with your personal core values. Yeah, that's great. I love that. What advice would you give your 20 something self? Yeah. So I'm older than 20, so I can totally give my, (laughs) but I'm I'm, um, approaching 30. So um, I would give my 20 year old uh, self the following advice. I would tell her to eliminate self doubt, stop second guessing herself and also stop seeking out validation and gold stars. And that Mm. you can find your own safety nets. Um, You don't need to constantly build them. They'll always be there. I love that. And what do you think your 80 year old self would be telling you right now? (laughs) Um, I think my 80 year old self would tell, I guess myself right now, when times, when you're, when you're operating outside your comfort zone, just continue to trust the process because what's meant for you won't miss you. Oh, I love that. (laughs) 
That's so good. That's a quotable. I love that. Okay. So can you please leave the women listening with your three best tips on living a good life? Ooh, okay. Three best tips for living a good life. Number one, let me think about this. Um, and it can be business related, per- personal or a combination. Yeah. So I think three best tips for living your best life. Number one, figure out what routine works for you. And I think that will help, you know, figure out what career is, is best designed for that. Mm-hmm. Number two, identify what your personal core values are and make sure that you constantly live in alignment with, with them. And third, don't seek out validation. Find your inner validation and your inner truth because that is going to be what leads you to your destinations and 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 make that journey even more colorful than anything else that has been laid out in front of you from someone else. So good. This has been such a pleasure. Um, where can people learn more about you and Silk and Sonder? Yeah, so you can definitely follow us on Instagram um, at Silk and Sonder. You can also follow me personally, although my Instagram is not as exciting. It's at Meha Agrawal. Um, you can also check out our website, www.silkandsonder.com, or find us on Facebook um, with the same at Silk and Sonder URL. Um, and if you want to drop us a note, always feel free. Hello at silkandsonder.com. What a pleasure. I loved learning more about your company. I wish you tremendous success. I can't wait to see where it goes in the next, you know, five years. And you can come back on and report when it's like it everywhere and just like, a con- it. right. So I look yes. forward to that. So I can't wait. Yeah, such a pleasure. I wish you the best. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you enjoyed the interview with Meha. And if you know of anyone who would benefit from her story, then please take a second to share it. As a reminder, all of the show notes can be found at thegoodlifecoach.com forward slash 046. And while you're there, I'd love to invite you to be a part of my community where each week you get an inspiring interview with information to uplift you in some way. Now, as a bonus, you automatically get for free 52 self-care tips. So if you have been struggling to make yourself a priority and could use some inspiration, a quick cheat sheet, some ideas of ways that you can incorporate you back into your life, then I invite you to sign up and you'll get it in your inbox immediately. So thank you for tuning in this week and I look forward to reconnecting next Wednesday. Bye for now.